Um, okay, so we are very happy to welcome you to the fifth webinar of our series. And as you may know, we are doing this series uh, with Polonium Foundation because the pandemic has forced us to postpone our normal science Polish, 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 sorry, Polish Perspectives Conference to May 2021. Um, so we are, we are going to be here for a couple of months with our webinars. And before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to in, remind you that all the information about the upcoming webinars uh, can be found on Polonium Foundation website, Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, we are also very excited to have NAVA, the Polish National Inst Agency for Academic Exchange, as our partners. <clears throat> so without further delay, uh, I would like to welcome our today's speaker, Aleksandra Walczak, who obtained her PhD in physics at the University of California in San Diego, after an, and after a postdoc, postdoc at the Kivli Institute for Theoretical Physics, moved to Princeton to become a theoretical physics fellow. And now Alexandra is a French National Center for Scientific Research, research director at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in, in Paris working on various aspects of biophysics. Alexandra is not new to Polonium Foundation events as she has been a speaker on one of our Science Polish Perspectives events. And today she's going to talk to us about uh, how if our immune repertoire is personalized and if it could be used in precision medicine. There will be time for questions from audience at the end of the talk. And to ask a question, please use the raise hand function that shows up when you click on the participants button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then I will unmute your microphone. You can ask your question. And if you don't want to ask your question um, live, you can just type it in the chat box and I will read it to Alexandra at the end of the talk. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, Alexandra, are you ready to share your screen with us? Okay, the work. You can see it, yeah. Can you see it? Okay, okay great. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, sorry, it's it's black. I don't know if it's just for me or it's black. Yes. Can you see this? Yes, yes, no, it's good. Okay, but this is black. No, this is this is good. That doesn't matter. Okay, now it's good, even yeah. this? Yes. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. This is the title slide, okay, uh, no, which no, basically, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so, I mean, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here in, in space with you. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to tell you about immune repertoires, which is what I told you about a few years ago, if you were there in the real life event in Berlin, but I'm going to take a slightly different uh, spin to it. First of all, let me just acknowledge the fact that this is a collaborative effort. This is work we've been doing with Thierry Morao over a number of years now. And specifically, I'll be talking about work done with our uh, Russian collaborators headed by Misha Pogorelli and Asia Minervina, and also with people uh, in Paris that are listed here, mainly Toma and Meriam, for, for the new stuff that I'll be talking about. All right. so. Uh, I'll start with a whodunit. So think back to the times before COVID when we actually went to real life scientific meetings. And uh, often they were in remote locations because as excited as we are as scientists to listen to talks, it's better to isolate us so we don't run away to see something exciting. Uh, that is not science. So there were of course excited scientists, great talks, we should close this. And often there was also an amazing party. And in one of these meetings, after such an event, the next day uh, in the conference, in this remote setting, Joe was found dead. So since these were scientists, they called for genetic tests for everyone because the killer inadvertently left some drops of blood next to Joe's body, which were found not to belong to Joe. Excuse me, Alex, uh, we lost yeah. your screen. Sorry? We lost your screen. The oh, you can't see my screen? Yeah, now it, you, like you completely stopped uh, sharing. That completely... That's not good. 
Is this okay now? Can you see it? Uh, yes, yes, now it's back. Thank you. Can you see yourself? What? No, no, no. We just if see I the presentation. We don't see the, the little. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right. So good. So anyway, uh, conference before. Joe, Joe is dead. Killer leaves blood. Genetic tests for everyone to identify the killer. And the genetic tests point to two conference participants that are identical twins, Alex and Terry. So everyone is in a loss because as much as everyone is a scientist, how are we going to differentiate genetically between identical twins? So they call upon Detective Asia Bear, who's a forensic uh, expert to solve this, to, to help out. And what Asia does is she turns to immune repertoire sequencing uh, to, to solve this, this puzzle. And she does that because the immune report provides a first medical record and a small farm pig will be able to tell us who the murderer is. So why is that? Well, your immune repertoire is made of many cells, T cells and B cells, let's focus on T cells. And these cells have receptors on the surface that recognize foreign pathogens. So we in our body have loads and loads, billions of different T cell receptors, but the but each cell has sorry, this billions of cells, but each cell has a specific receptor. And this makes up a diverse ensemble of different cells, which is called our immune repertoire. And in so each one of us also has a different distribution of these cells in a sample. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons which I'll get into, but one of the reasons is that when we encounter an infection, T cells that have a receptor that's able to recognize, say, a virus, a foreign pathogen, proliferate and make many copies of themselves. So then you have subsets which are cl 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 clones of cells that are identical, and then depending on the different infections that we encountered, we're going to have different distributions of these clones. So we're basically going to have a different makeup. So although all of us have an adaptive immune system, all of us have T cells, we all have a slightly different distribution of different kinds of T cells. And this is what allows Asia to help us out. More specifically, uh, she uses a technique which is called imprint, which stands for immune fingerprint, which from this thump rig of blood uh, allows her to say whether a given blood sample comes, so for example, such as the blood sample that was found by Joe's body, it belongs to basically what person it belongs to if she has a large number of people to, cho to, to choose from. So specifically, she can, she, by comparing two blood samples, she can figure out whether this blood sample comes from the same person or not the same person. So if it comes from the same, if two blood samples from the same person, then we'll call that situation autologous. And if they come from different people, that means that it's heterologous. So by comparing the blood sample found uh, next to Joe's body, Asia will be able to figure out whether this comes from a, the, the, by, by comparing it to different people in the conference, she'll be able to find the, the killer that it, uh, Joe's killer and eliminate all different people. And she'll basically base her method, uh, so imprint is based on the idea that the, if you compare two blood samples and they come from the same uh, person, you're going to share more different T cells between the two samples than if they come from different people. So you're still going to share some between different people because the cells, these receptors, these T cells that we all have, these are called public in immunology. And then there are ones that are specific to us, which are private. But if you look at the two blood samples coming from the same person, you're going to have more private cells. Sorry, you're going to have sh you're going to share more cells uh, because you also share some of the private ones. Simply because of this fact that we all build our clones and we all build our specific immune makeup. 
So this is data to just prove the point. If you look at two blood samples of a given size, uh, and you just ask what's the number of shared sequences between two samples, you'll see that samples that come from different people, uh, from the same person, have many more shared sequences than sequences that come from different people. And the important thing here for our story is that identical twins fall in the same category as different people. Basically, there's nothing special about uh, the uh, identical twins when it comes to comparing the immune repertoires compared to anybody else in the world. So thanks to that, thanks to the fact that identical twins, they are genetically identical, still have very different immune repertoires, as they is a tell us that the evil twin is in fact Alex and not Terry, and that is Joe's kill. But since this is a group of scientists, they all want to know how uh, this works. What are the details? And in fact, why are there any cells that are shared between any people? And why is there such a large difference here between the cells shared by uh, two samples from the same person and two samples from different people? Okay, so we have to dwell a little bit more into immune repertoire. Uh, details and understand where they come from. So remember what the immune repertoire is, are these cells of the immune system which have receptors on the surface. And receptors are of course proteins and proteins are encoded in the DNA. So if you wanted to, so I told you already that genetic sequencing will not solve the problem, but if these are proteins and if they're encoded by the DNA, in the DNA, that means that uh, there must be some DNA coding for it. So the first thing to realize is that you have of the order of a billion different receptors. So if we forget about this clonality, we forget that a given receptor can come in multiple copies, you still have a billion different receptors. That means you would have to code a billion different immune genes. A billion is a big number, it's the number of people on Earth. And if that were the case, generally you have of the order of 10 to the 4, so 10,000 different uh, genes in your body. A billion is five orders of magnitude more. So basically, this would not fit into your nucleus. That's what DNA is in the cell and this additional DNA that would be needed to code for these different proteins would not fit there. And that means your nucleus would have to be 30 centimeters long and that means you as a person if we scale up would have to be as high as Mount Everest. So obviously that's not the way it works and nature has come up with this funky way of combining combinatorics and randomness to generate diversity. So instead of coding for each of these receptor proteins directly, it's for a certain number. We have genes coding for a certain number of templates. Uh, the, each of these receptors, to simplify, is made out of three parts. They're called V, D, and J. And we code for some number of templates for V, the V part, the D part, and the J part. These are genes. And then, the DNA in your cells actually gets edited. The DNA in your cells and your immune cells gets edited. You pick one V, one D, one J. And if you look at these numbers, this gives you about a thousand different combinations. But I said a billion. So how do we get to a billion? Then comes a, the additional editing process that edits the already edited DNA, already cut DNA in your cells, and randomly inserts and deletes nucleotides between the V and the D and the D and the J genes. So basically you've put together different parts and now you're adding additional nucleotides and you're taking them out. So you're sort of like building words out of, uh, out of genes and out of non-templated regions. And this is how you get to a billion different receptors, which as I said, then clonally expand. So then you get different distributions of this already different makeup. And one thing to realize is that um, each one of, so this is a random process, a stochastic process. It takes part in each one of us. So although we have the same machinery to generate these 
different immune cell receptors, we're going to do it differently. So the receptors you generate and the receptors I generate are going to be different. And specifically the receptors that Alex generates and the receptors that Terry generates, although the twins are going to be different. And thanks to that, and then thanks to their additional different experiences, we can distinguish them. But can we actually be so sure? Well, no, so because you could still imagine this is machinery, but in fact, it generates very similar sets of receptors in each one of us. This isn't the case, and this we know thanks to immune repertoire sequencing. So you go in, you get a blood test, for this, you actually need to donate a little bit more blood than a, a thumb prick for us to have shown this. But now that it's shown, nobody needs more of your blood. Uh, and uh, you can sort out the, the, the immune receptors. And then we can use this data, so the sequence data. These sequences here are just nucleotide sequences to build a generative model. So we built a probabilistic mathematical model guided by the data where we basically say, if I look at any given sequence, I don't know how it was produced. Because of these insertions and deletions, because of this cutting and pasting, each sequence can be used in many different ways. But I can consider all possible scenarios that are consistent with this sequence. And if I do this for all sequences, I can then assign weights in there and then calculate the probability of using a given gene, having so many different insertions, deletions, and so on. Basically, I, I put in a, I, I consider a model and I learn the elements of this model and I can self-consistently show this is uh, the simplest possible. Okay, in, in, in short, either you, on, you, you know, you're interested in the gory details of this kind of modeling, or let me just say, we have a method of figuring out what's the probability of generating, of your body to generate any specific immune uh, receptors. So with that, we can then look at the data and ask uh, what's the distribution with which you generate these sequences, what's the distribution with which I generate these sequences, and what's the distribution with which anybody in the world generates these sequences. And I can tell you that this distribution is very reproducible for all of us. So we don't generate the same sequences, but we have the same probability of generating these sequences. So that means that we have some receptor sequences that are very easy to generate. Of course, easy is relative, so they have a probability of one in a million to be generated, which is roughly the probability of giving birth to quadruplets. But then there are ones that are much harder to generate, which have a probability of one in a trillion trillion to be generated and less. And this is basically the probability of two hard disks failing at exactly the same time. But since it's a random process, we generate sequences from all across the board. It's just the ones here are more likely to be found in many of us because we're more likely to have generated. And why is that? Well, let's think of the numbers for a second. It's one in a million, but we generate, we have at an, any given time, a billion different receptors. That means that one in a million means we still have a fairly large probability to all have generated the ones that are here. So anyway, now for any receptor sequence, we can say what is the probability with which it's generated and what's the probability that I should be surprised that I find it in you and, my, uh, and uh, you and anybody else in the world? And we can also ask, well, okay, so we keep on generating these different receptors. We have these very diverse repertoires, uh, but as a whole world population, have we generated all possible T cell receptors in the world? Have we exhausted the possibilities of this random machinery? And the answer is no. So basically these are different, um, the, the, the black line maybe is the, is the model prediction for if you look in so many people, so if you look at 10 people, how many different T cell receptors do you expect to see? 
uh, a thousand, a hundred thousand, and so on, up until a hundred billion. Uh, and you see that it doesn't flatten off. So even if we were to, were to look at a hundred billion people, we still wouldn't exhaust the possibility of this machinery to generate diversity. And that's why we look at any new person, we see receptors that are specific to that person and that can be called private, well, that are called private in, in immunology. We, of course, see some that are shared with other people, but it's this property that allows us to distinguish people. The red line is what we've, uh, is, but basically the blue line is what we've sampled so far in all the collective experiments that have been performed in this that it were, we're of the order of having looked at a thousand people. So you can extrapolate that just to see where it goes. So there's some difference from sampling, but with the number of people in the world today, and even if it grows a hundred times bigger, we still have not exhausted the diversity of this. Thing. That means that if we get a blood sample from anybody in the world and we compare it with all the other people in the world, we can still identify two blood samples coming from the same person, even looking at a billion people. We won't be fooled because our immune repertoire is so specific, it's such a specific signature of us. And this is the property that is being used in imprint, and this is what ASIA used uh, to I then to differentiate Alex from Terry and say that Alex is Joe's killer. Now, Alex, being a scientist, tried to argue, and Alex said, but wait, how do I know, uh, you know, my repertoire also changes with time, I have different infections, you took a blood sample a few days later, how do you know it was me? Well, unfortunately for Alex, your immune repertoire is also quite, well, the number of shared sequences that you share right now between yourself and you a couple of days or months later, the repertoire is so stable that you're still, even if you take the blood sample a few months later, you're still able to distinguish uh, Alex from Alex and everybody else in the sample. So bad news for them. But as you see, this the, the fact that we are able to identify people uniquely, even in a very large cohort, even in a very large group of people, we're able to say whether two blood samples belong to the same person. Well, it's good news for forensics and people like Detective Asia Bear, but it does and Potentially, it's good news for medical records uh, because your immune repertoire is a very good medical record. It's like a medical record that you cannot lie about because it has signatures of all the infections and other uh, pathogenicities that you've ever encountered. However, at the same time, this cause, calls into question various bioethics problems because now we can identify anybody and our medical record is in fact available to all that have access to our immune report. So this is something to think about in another perspective. Okay, but the other thing that came out during this test because they had to uh, look at, they had to sequence the immune repertoire of everybody in the conference is that although Terry is not the killer, but they have COVID. And so does Pat, another participant of the conference. So now this puts us into a reality that we're uh, more familiar now, right now, that conferences go online, everybody's wearing masks, but they still ask questions because the scientists, and one of the questions asked, okay, but we've all become immune specialists over the last few months, and we know that you do PCR tests to find the virus, uh, but when you do the serological test, you're actually looking for antibodies, and antibodies are B cells, and what Asia Be sequence was these, people T, these people's T cells. So how can she figure out anything about COVID when we know that 
viral infections and COVID specifically are all about B cells. Well, that's not true. That became the media that everybody was talking about antibodies. When you couldn't find antibodies in somebody, the, the media told us, oh, there's no immune memory for COVID. But there's also T cells. And there's also, sorry, immune memory. I mean, immunity against uh, COVID for people who have obviously had it because it was verified by PCR test. But that's not true. You can also have. Uh, immunity thanks to T cells and your T cell and B cell repertoires work together to protect you. So by looking at T cells, you can still see signatures uh, of a past COVID infection. And this is what we showed. So before coming to this conference, Terry and Pat went on a skiing holiday together. So obviously in February of uh, 2020, they went to a packed ski resort. And since we now know that they really like to party, they went to the after ski party. And when they came back from the skiing holiday, they were automatically put into quarantine. And coming out of the quarantine, they got tested and uh, found to be COVID positive by st tra traditional uh, measures as a serological tests. Uh, the, and so, nevertheless, they decided, okay, I'm going to donate blood. And they donated uh, blood samples at day 15 past infection, 30, 37, 45, and 85. Uh, so basically, they gave, they, they gave blood samples that were then sequenced, and they sequenced the, uh, the TCR report. And the other good news is that Terry and Pat also had the repertoire sequenced in 2018 and 2019. So we had the pre-infection, pre-COVID infection repertoires to uh, compare with. And if you look at traces, so basically what this will give you is you can look at specific T cell clones as a function of time, and you can ask what it looks like. And this is what it looks like if you look at the so this is the different cell sequences, the different, different clone types, and how they change over time. And you see it's a mess. So the only purpose for which I'm showing it is that it's a mess and it's hard to say anything. However, what you can do is you can do a very preliminary analysis. This is really not what you should be doing, but just to get an idea, you do a PCA over the trajectories. So you take one of these trajectories that, well, you take all of these trajectories that I just shown, showed and you try to figure out whether they cluster in any way. And if you do that, you find that they do cluster. You identify three clusters in both Terry and Pat. The, the, the data is the same. One cluster, the cluster is that T cells that absolutely nothing over this time. So we're not going to be interested in them. But then there's two other clusters. There's the green cluster, which are T cell clones that systematically decline with time. So remember our first time point here is day 15 after the infection. And from day 15, their counts go down. So whether you've had COVID or not, by now you probably know that it's basically a fortnight that you feel bad during. And this is, this is the fortnight where you get the the strong immune response. So basically these green lines are what we expect. Your T cell counts went up here. Remember, just as a sort of general reminder, what are T cells and what are B cells? The lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are white blood cells. That's the thing that you get on your blood test result when, you know, when you're sick and you go to the doctor, they take your blood and they say, ah, you have high white blood cells. That's what we're talking about here. So basically, you'd expect them to shoot up during the infection and then go down, just like the green line. Um, however, there's also this yellow cluster. And this yellow cluster was unexpected because it shows a peak of a response at day 37. So it's like a late kind of response. But anyway, so sort of preliminaries is just saying we cluster these trajectories gives us this response but we know actually to do better than that because I showed you the data and that the raw data is incredibly noisy 
But luckily, when they gave blood, uh, these samples were divided into replicates. And why is that important? Because there's a lot of noise in this process. So the other way to see the noise, except for these trajectories that tell us absolutely nothing, is if you look at the counts for specific uh, clones, for specific T cells, in, at day 15 of the same person. So you're basically comparing just two technical replicates. Uh, you know, somebody takes blood, divides it into two tubes, and then sequences them, does all the pre-processing, and then sequences them separately. And you look at what comes out as data. And you see that in some samples, you in, in some cases, you have clones that in one subsample had zero counts, but in the other one had 100. So this huge noise in, in this process, and what we want to do is we want to break this noise. So we're going to look at this data. We're going to take the data from the same person, from the same time point, and we're going to learn a probabilistic model. So where does the noise come from, except for experimental procedures? Well, the noise comes from uh, a number of things. First of all, there's sound uh, that we're familiar with. But the other thing is, let's think about what happens. So the, what we have here is we have a certain, in reality, if we had all the information available to us, forget size, forget other problems, the, there's a distribution of frequency. That each clone has a given frequency in your body. We're going to call that frequency X. Okay, I can tell you it's a power law, it doesn't matter. There's just some distribution of frequency. Then what you're doing is uh, you're taking the, these clones, you're taking these cells, and you're taking mRNA out of them, okay? When you're doing the experiment, you're actually sequencing, you're doing uh, cDNA sequencing, which means you're taking mRNA, and then turning it into DNA to sequence it. Now, mRNA has this procedure that in a given cell, the same cell with the same receptor will express RNA, mRNA differently. mRNA is expressed in bursts. So burst just means that you can have a lot or you cannot have a lot. So this is the source of noise. And then we do the experiment, we sample this DNA for sequencing, so there's something noise. So basically, I won't bore you with the details, but we can take into account all these kinds of sources and we can calibrate the noise model. So we can say, okay, this may not look like a straight line to you, but we know how to turn it into a straight line. We know how to ignore everything that's beyond the straight line. And then we use that as input for inferring was actually a real response. Now, I thought about cutting this, but I thought it's important to leave it. Uh, so basically, we see frequency before the infection, and then we see some infection, and we see some frequency after. And since it's, an, it's a large response, it's an exponential response. You can argue this better. Uh, and then we say, well, if we look at our data, some fraction of clones expanded, and some didn't. I mean, some responded, and some didn't. And we can, again, build the a posteriori uh, probability of figuring out which actually expanded uh, given this model and given our ex uh, experimental efforts. Anyway, again, for the experts out there, for the non-experts out there, I put it in because there's an exponential. And when we talk about COVID and Arnold and growth, everybody should know what an exponential is now. So. If we, anyway, you can forget about the details. We have a way of analyzing the data where we can actually figure out which clone is expanding and which clone is not expanding. And by comparing the, the T cell receptor sequences, sequence on day 15 with day 85, we're able to recover this contracting trend. So you can say, wait, 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 but you have a peak here, but before you just had things go down. Uh, yes, but now I'm adding the pre-infection time points. So we can actually see this is a large response, that if year or two before these T cells were there, but in small numbers, 
and then they shoot sh would shoot up and then they go down as uh, the infection passes. And the same is true for Ted, uh, Terry and Matt. And then we have see we can also identify by comparing day 15 to day 37, the secondary peak, this late peak. And I can tell you additionally to that, that these clones that in both cases we identify as responding are not known to be specific to any known viruses, or most known viruses that are there in the data. Okay, so uh, we, we identify some cells as, as responding. Uh, I have to, before I go on, remind you about one thing about immune cells. We already talked about where they come from, that they're regenerated in this random process. Then basically there's a testing step that I won't talk about, but not all of these generated ones made it, make it, but if you make it, if they're deemed to be good enough to protect us in principle, then they're set out into the periphery to do the job and recognize pathogens, and that's where they proliferate. And that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about this response. However, after an infection happens, some fraction of the cells that proliferate get set aside and in what's called a memory repertoire. So they basically given back, sort of saying like, that you've been to war, you nice thing hang around. So you don't keep all of them because they expand large numbers. You see them decrease later, but after they've decreased, a small subset of them gets kept so that the next time you see something similar, you're faster to respond. You're the expert now. You've seen, I've seen this. I know what to do with this. So it's this memory repertoire which gives you immunity. It gives you existing immunity. So we can ask the question, whether Pad and Terry have pre-existing immunity. And so the first thing we can see is that they do, so first of all, after the infection, we see they keep memory. Both Pad and Terry, these are different subsets, not important for the non-experts. You have stable memory post-infection. And for the super experts, I can tell you that uh, these are seen in very long-lived memory subcompartments, the post-infection ones. But also, if we look at the pre-infection time points, you also, see, uh, you, you also see the cells that are then identified as responding. And you see them um, in both the effector and the memory subset. So basically, there's responding clonotypes, the ones that will respond to COVID as seen in at the as seen at the pre-infection time point, which we've seen from the uh, from from the previous uh, graph. Okay, so take home of this is that you have stable post memory, but you also have pre-existing uh, memory. Now, the thing you can maybe asking yourself is how do you know this is specific, right? I just showed you some response. I mean, these two were locked up in quarantine. God knows what they did. Um, maybe this is just some random response to something else, some other virus. Maybe this is just some other reaction. Maybe they ate too much peanuts and got an allergic reaction. So how do we know it's COVID specific? So, there's a, way, there's, there's a way of testing, which is sort of a fishing expedition, uh, which is called a tetramus study. So basically what you do is you put in a COVID specific protein on the molecular equivalent of a fishing rod, which looks like this. And then you ask which of Pat's T cells, because Pat participated in the study, Terry didn't, uh, actually respond to, uh, to this COVID protein. So we'll hook up to this COVID protein. And this is a sort of, this is um, an in vivo, is, is an in vivo version of what happens in real life where the pathogen, so the COVID protein, is presented to the cell with the T cell receptor and it binds it. So here it's all 
also presented to the team, but then it's tacked to something that will light up the moment you, uh, you, you look at it the right way. And so Pat participated in the study 24 days past uh, post-infection, and they were able to pull out the T cells uh, that are specific to one COVID protein they test. And so we can then look at T cells that they pulled out in that study and see how the frequency changes in our data over different time points. And we see that we again reproduce this trend of, uh, of the, what we call the contracting clonotypes that there's a peak at day 15 and then they contract. But this shows that basically, the, so the contracting ones that we identify are really COVID specific and more specifically the green dots here are the ones that were identified as high frequency, uh, are the ones that we identified independently the computational study about before as responding and you see that that way we're catching all the COVID is uh, all the high frequency COVID specific T cells that are specific to this one. So these are COVID specific cells that we're able to get from a purely longitudinal approach from one person at a time. Okay. Um, so may I just go quickly here to finish up? So there's another thing that we know from previous studies is that T cells that respond to a given protein are, more, are quite similar to each other. So they have what are, what's called similar motifs. So we can look, we can just look in the data agnostically and ask, can I find clusters that are similar. And so we build a link between any two cells, T cells, that have the same V and the J gene and differ by uh, one, at most two amino acid mismatch in this central region, that where you get the insertions and deletions. Okay, so if you have a sequence that looks like this and a sequence that looks like that, they only differ here, so we're going to put a line here. So we can build clusters. It's like that, and we can do the Terry's data. You find some clusters. You re-identify the cells that are specific to this fishing rod we just put in, the specific tetramer. But that doesn't seem to be the biggest cluster. The biggest cluster is this pink one, OK? Don't worry about the letters. Don't worry about the details. Uh, it's just to illustrate a story. So what, what can this tell us? Well. So what can we, we can use another study, which is basically a large scale fishing exhibition to learn something about that specific uh, cluster and also make sure that it's COVID specific. So this is a, a large scale fishing exhibition, which is called Mirror. Uh, it's from a company called Adaptive. And what they did is basically they took a lot of COVID proteins and put them here. And so each row has the same protein, different uh, samples of blood from different uh, people here. And then they see what sticks. Basically for each COVID protein, they figure out which epitopes stick. And through doing some sort of combinator combinatoric analysis, they're able to figure out which protein maps to which TCR. So which T cell receptor is specific for which COVID protein. So we're gonna use the result of this study. The important thing from the study is they have a link. They say this T cell receptor recognizes this protein. So we're gonna mix their data with our data, with all of our data. Um, with the, the, respond, the ones that we call responding. And we're again going to build this similarity network. So we're going to say, out of all of these, make links between proteins that are similar, that are basically have the same amino acid sequence, modulo one or two amino acids. We'll, we'll identify this way, we'll find clusters, but then we'll know for each cluster what COVID protein it corresponds to. And if we do that, we can map, we find 32 clusters corresponding to 32 different 
uh, COVID proteins. And they all correspond to our contracting forms. So the one thing that comes out of this fishing exhibition is this pink one, uh, which is which we can now link to a specific COVID epitope. The interesting thing about this is it's what it's called Im immunodominant. So basically 21% of all of Pat's response is taken up by this one clone. So it's very specific. But as I said, and we know that this one, this, this, uh, this cells from this cluster are already there in Pat's memory. So Pat has immunity a year before. But we also know that, so this is the COVID protein that is being recognized by cells in this cluster. And if we mutate one amino acid in this pro COVID protein, um, this corresponds to a motif that is specific against the common cold. So basically what it seems like is Pat got the common cold a while ago and they developed memory against this. And thanks to this, Pat now had immunity against COVID and that's why their infection was so mild when they Possible. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. This is just to say that we actually are able using this move say whether somebody had COVID or didn't have COVID. So we have diagnostic power uh, based on a small sample of people and using these moves. But in the interest of time, I'll skip that. And just to summarize, um, I showed you that we have essentially infinite power uh, to generate diversity. So humanity is fine, at least in this one respect. Uh, you carry around with you a unique medical record. So be careful and don't kill anyone, even if you think you're safe because you have a twin. And in terms of COVID, we seem to be seeing two waves of response. We don't really understand what the second wave corresponds to. You can have pre-existing uh, COVID memory and afterwards you can have stable T cell memory even if you don't have T cells. Uh, and we have a way of diagnosing um, stuff. But okay, I guess the question you really want to know is why did Alex kill Joe? And this is something we don't completely have an answer to yet, so I'm open uh, for ideas. And uh, I'd like to sort of show you the characters that took part in the, in the data analysis. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, who's the cat in the middle? It's not listed. So the cat actually, this is cat. This is, this is one of our collaborators cats analyzing specifically the data that I told you about. All right, that's a very useful lab member. Great. <laughs> so um, does anyone have any questions? As I said before, you can write them in the chat and I will read them uh, aloud or, or you can click on the participants button and raise your hand and then I can unmute you. And um, when we are waiting for, for other questions, I, I was just wondering, have you seen, uh, like, do people very vary in terms of the like, abundance of, of the T cells uh, in COVID re response? Yeah, they vary a lot. So uh, in, in this story, Terry had a much weaker response than Pat. And then we, we analyzed the third person who had yet a weaker response. So, I mean, they do vary generally in terms of uh, how strong the response is. And this is something that we also see in people that we see a huge heterogeneity uh, of responses. So I, I, I sort of, I forgot to say this, but both uh, Pat and Terry had very mild symptoms. So they didn't, they, they, they lost a uh, sense of smell, but they didn't, they, they didn't get seriously sick. So now we're trying to analyze also people that are hospitalized 
and see what the differences are. But even within group, you can see big differences in how the strength of the response. Thank you. Um, have you had anyone completely asymptomatic to see whether there is a difference? No, we ha we haven't because well, basically the okay the the this even getting hospitalized pe for patients is not so easy. There's a lot of sort of protocol uh, problems, but I mean like, right now we are conducting a study with hospitalized people, and we hope to uh, compare that to uh, to asymptomatic people. Thank you. Um, I don't know any question from, from the audience. Oh, we got a question from Gosha. Uh, would you like to, uh, I unmuted you. If Gosha, if you'd like to, yes. Right. Thank you. All right, I was just typing. Um, Alexandra, great talk as always. Really like it. Gosha Trinka here from the Sanga Institute. Um, I've got a, question a bit, a bit um, touching upon your work on the diversity of uh, TCR. I was wondering if you looked at whether there is any preferential, whether there are any preferential uh, TCR clonotypes in relationship to the HLA molecules or HLA types. I think we've lost. Oops. Uh, yeah, I think we lost Alexandra. Uh, hmm. <laughs> the question was too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there was some. I can't. I can't get that question again. Oh, uh, uh, Alexandra. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> something. Something seriously wrong happened. So, can we? Oops. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Can okay. you ask the question again? I got thrown out, I think. Yeah, sure. No, it was funny because I thought you just like went, oh no, I can't, I can't do this question. I, I run away. <laughs> I run away from the question. Oh my um, God, what's this question now? Now I'm scared. No, no. My question was about your work on TCR diversity and how it's, you know, infinite and so on. But yet there are certain clothes that we see more often. Um, and my question is, if you, if you looked at or if you are familiar with work that would look at the relationship between the HLA types and the TCR, um, yeah, if, if there are any preferences, if there's non-interaction that given certain HLA types, you're more likely to, you know, promote certain TCR. Yeah, types. so we're, we're very actively looking at this. In fact, right as we were coming online, I was editing a paper on this. It's surprisingly hard to see stuff, maybe because we're not sampling HLA types enough. Although, so this is also the part that I skipped. Okay, I skipped the part about HLA types. So I can, uh, you, you, so, okay. So Terry and Pat have different HLA motifs. And in fact, Terry has quite an unusual HLA motif pad is more, more usual. And so one thing you see is that the clusters, they're completely non-overlapping. And that, why is that? Because they have different HLA types, possibly. I mean, that's one, one of the reasons. And one of the reasons we think that is we basically ask the we look at this motif from, from Terry and we ask, can we, um, can we figure out basically whether you have COVID or you don't based on just by looking at how frequent this motif is in people who had COVID and who didn't? And you can't, unless you only look at people who have the same HLA type as, uh, as Terry. And we can actually identify the HLA type, Terry's HLA type, just from data. So there's a method uh, by Phil Bradley and colleagues where 
uh, he, basically just by looking at by having as one data set by having one data set that has where you know the HLA type and then seeing T cells in a cohort where you don't have the HLA type but seeing how often you see the same T cells that have nothing to do with any response you can figure you can infer a person's HLA type so yes there is signature uh, but we you know so we're sort of playing with this about how far we can push it and we were, we were hoping to see sort of identify HLA specific motifs so that's proving harder but you can definitely identify a person's HLA type based on the set of T cells that responds. Thanks for the question. Oh, now I see the small questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so I was, I just also wanted to add that Alexander agreed to stay here for a little bit longer if there are more questions for some minutes, so we will not cut the webinar short at, uh, at the full hour. So there was the first question from uh, Milena Malharek. Uh, I hope I pronounce it well. Uh, does our immunity uh, rely on types of T cells form around the time of our birth? And is it possible to generate receptors responding to specific antigens later in life? Yeah, yes, yes, and yes. These are, this is a really cool question. Okay, so uh, where, where do I start? Uh, so we do have a story about the the, the developing of uh, of T cell repertoires, and it starts actually in utero, uh, but then it continues. So that this you basically uh, continue you you produce new T cells all throughout life, but until you hit adulthood, you produce a lot more of them, and uh, it does. The, and the, the, the same is true for B cells. We did the study on T cells because that's what we had uh, available and we did it in mice, but generally we know that the story is similar. So, I mean, there's so many leads here that I don't know where to go, but basically, yes, it depends on your experiences. It depends on uh, where you go. Basically, the probability of you to generate stuff doesn't depend on anything where we really have the same probability to generate sequences all throughout our life and uh, and well not okay all throughout our life i should say as life as when we're here uh, but we uh, and everybody on the planet at least everybody we've looked at has the same probability to, to generate sequences however the composition will differ and it will differ uh, depending on your experiences. And maybe one anecdotal story that's interesting here is the notion of antigenic sin. So this is kind of cool. If you look, I mean, say you want to lie about what, how old you are, right? I mean, it could happen to you. You're like, oh, well, I'm 20 years younger than I really am, right? Well, if they sample your blood, and they look at your dominant, the, the T cells you have that are, so maybe it's B cells, but at basically the immune cells that, are do, that respond to, to the flu, they can figure out up to a year or two how old you are based on the flu strain that you first encountered. So, you know, when we're young, when we're within the first few years of our life, we, we're probably going to encounter some flu strain and we're going to produce a reaction to that flu strain. And it's gonna be so much bigger that first reaction we ever produce than to any other flu strain you're gonna see later, that that basically dates you up to a few years. So you can't lie about your age. Is that, I, I, I forgot the rest of the question if there was one. But those were two thoughts that came into my mind. I can go on about, you know, what changes between a new tarot and, uh, and then when, when you're actually born, but maybe not, um, maybe I should take another question. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And um, I guess we should end. Oh, sorry. The, okay. There was the, is it possible to generate receptors responding? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, otherwise we'd be screwed. Right. I mean, Imagine you see COVID now, you're not going to die, right? So yes, you definitely, 
uh, produce receptors responding to specific antigens later in life. And that's also the case with the flu strain, right? The flu evolves and you see different strains every year. You know, many of us are protected. Most of us are protected. So completely, this is a very adaptive, very changing system. Uh, what's interesting is also as you get older, the size of your memory pool becomes larger compared to your naive pool. As you, when you're young, your naive pool is, 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 is big and then your memory pool gets larger. So in a way you become more experienced, but less versatile, but you can still do it even when you're old. Sorry. I'm Thank you. So I guess the take home lessons from today are uh, don't kill anyone and don't lie about your age. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have we got a couple of more questions if you have time. Um, so one was uh, from Gabriela. Uh, she wanted to ask if there were an opportunity that uh, if there were an opportunity that immune repertoire methods would be spread over the wor world, uh, could it help finding missing people? Yeah, I mean, yes. At least I like, you know, definitely. Okay, so there's no one thing to say is that there's no link between you're no more similar to your mother, to your bi biological mother than you are to the men on the street. Right. So it, it can be used for, 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 for parent, you know, for parental uh, analysis. Uh, but like say somebody you know think of memento right there was this movie some 20 years ago which i guess dates me pretty accurately uh about a guy who was born every day like he is he every time he woke up he didn't remember anything he couldn't form memories so this is a no neurological condition also and uh if you know if there's somebody who just had amnesia and then, but then continued living a normal life, but you have their blood from before and you know who they were before, you can identify them, yes. There's a good question that I don't know the answer to, is how long, like after what time will you actually not be able to distinguish the person? Like how, how long does the stability keep? Uh, I don't know that, but we're trying to figure that out. So we obviously don't have data because data is just, a few for, for a few years now this, these techniques haven't been around that long but we're trying to learn models and answer questions with these, such questions with these models that's cool that's actually a cool application thanks thank you um i got another question on the pri uh, chat privately from uh jakob Czarny. um can you state if the diversity of immune proteins has changed during the whole human's evolution? And if not, is it possible to predict it somehow? And kind of that's a very good. Okay, so that's a very good question. And this is also why, you know, comparing us to mice is, is interesting, right? And, and other species. I mean, there's this whole question because we have so this kind of adaptive immune system, which is completely funky, adaptive, changing, diverse, we share it with all jawed vertebrates and everything sort of further along on the evolutionary tree. Okay, a jawed vertebrate is any fish you may eat. Um, so of course the molecules are not exactly the same, but it, 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 I mean, the, the, it's very, the genes are not the same, but they're very similar. Um, so that's one aspect of the question. And then you can ask, okay, but there's still been some selection pressure on these VJ genes to look the way they, uh, they look. And uh, so where does that come from? That's one very good question. The other question is there are these sequences, these receptors that are more likely to be produced than others that like essentially all of us produce, right? They're called public. So you sort of tempted to say that the public ones, the ones that we all have, well, they're probably there against some uh, pathogen, right? Some pathogen that has been around with us forever and ever. And so, so far, if that's true, we haven't found this pathogen, okay? If you look at, at any known pathogen and the T cells that are specific to them, they're all all, all over the board. That doesn't mean that that's not true, that you know, there isn't some pressure, but 
I mean, at least there's now no sort of smoking gun evidence. We haven't found it yet. And um, it's a very interesting question about how we've been co-evolving with pathogens, something that I'm very, very interested in. So like if anybody finds a fossil record with RNA, it's like this is really unlikely because you know, we know RNA is not very stable. But I mean, that would, that, or even immune DNA, that, that would be pretty interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, so that's one answer to the question. I mean, the short answer is I have no idea, but I'd love to know. Uh, even on the timescale of our lives, right? So there's things like the flu that really evolve constantly. And we can see, we can sort of track uh, I mean, what, what we'd like to be able to do is see signatures of this evolution in, in our immune systems. But, you know, we're, we're not there yet. These are all excellent questions. So the second, thank you, in this, there's the second part of the question of uh, can the protein's diversity and its changes have direct impact on the susceptibility to diseases? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what the flu does. The flu runs away, basically. Okay, so there's, there's an interest. And so there's HIV, for example, and, and, you know, fast evolving viruses. So the difference between the flu and HIV is that the HIV in a person who has it, it's really an arms race inside this person's body. HIV is running away and its immune system is trying to catch it. And you see this, you see the strong selection pressure. For the flu, it's all of us. It's a population-wide selection pressure. And uh, so this is maybe harder to see. Flu evolves much more slowly than HIV, uh, but it evolves under the, the, the pressure of all our immune systems. So, and that you, you also see it in the virus. You have like this ballistic escape in, in um, some sort of phenotypic space, you, you know, people have been mapping it. So that, that, that's, uh, that's definitely true. I wanted to say something else. But yes, you know, oh, oh, COVID, right? So then there's a big question. Right now, COVID isn't evolving very fast. I mean, there's, you know, there's mutations, but nothing has been sticking. The selection pressure is fairly limited. But that's a big question, like, because it's been very, very, it's been a very, very short time. So if we wait, I mean, if we look at flu on the same time scale as we've been looking at COVID, we wouldn't see anything either. So, you know, what will happen in X number of years? Where will that go? These are, these are interesting questions. Thank you. There was one other question from Tomek, but it's quite similar to the ones um, asked before. Or maybe how, how is the difference that our diversity to, to, for example, apes? Yeah, apes we don't know because nobody sequenced them. Uh, we have more diversity than mice. Uh, again, you can, you know, mice, the, the mice that everybody's looking at for sort of more uh, protocol reasons are. Uh, lab mice, so you could say, well, maybe that's because of uh, of the you know that they're in the lab, but I doubt it because you know, fifty years or so, or even eighty years hasn't be. I don't think that's enough time to really reduce the diversity of the machinery, and you really see that at the level of the generative machinery, they have much less diversity uh, than we do. So. Um, and fish have even less. But now, okay, now there's an interesting question. The immune system is a sensory system, right? It's like smell, it's like sight, it's just a sensory system for pathogens. And so we know that sensory systems co-evolve with the signals they receive. Um, and uh, so, so the question is like, does this mean that the space of the pathogens that's attacking us is so much larger than the space of pathogens that attack mice. That seems unlikely because we live in the same environment. So, you know, maybe this is rather linked to our life uh, expectancy. I guess it would be interesting to see how it varies in, in, in various organisms you do, yeah. as you do and, and see what it correlates to. 
Um, we have a question from Tomek this time on, on camera, so I'll ask you to unmute. Uh, yes. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, thanks for the great talk. And my question is kind of related about the co-evolution co and is if you had an access to some isolated human communities, like in the middle of Amazonia or from those islands south of uh, India, where they are probably isolated for a very, very long time, what would you expect to see if you were able to sequence them? Would you be able to see any any traces? Of so there's a guy in in uh, New Zealand, in, I think he's in New Zealand, who asked himself exactly this question. So he went to Papua New Guinea. Basically, he said, "Okay, enough of this, you know, Euro, um, US, North American supremacy. All these people that we have in databases, I mean, essentially they're genetically the same. You know, show me real diversity." He did it is at the level of just uh, of characterizing the VDJ makeup, so you know not the level of of diversity, but I think it's an instructive story, and I think the same same would uh, hold true. So what I did and what I sort of swept under the rug is that of course we have polymorphisms in these genes in these VJ genes. So when he went to Papua New Guinea and he sequences people. Lo and behold, they had more polymorphism than the whole database until that point. Okay, not surprising. And what, what is sort of sociologically interesting is until he did that, people were sort of saying, oh, V, V, DJ gene polymorphisms, not interesting. We just give one sequence, that's it. We don't care about polymorphisms. So he came up and suddenly everybody's like, oh yeah, polymorphisms are important. So uh, that, to say that there are differences, you know, there are differences in, with, between us, but once we an, identify a V gene and we can identify, uh, you know, take into account the little differences and all that, I mean, the machinery is so reproducible. So, okay, there's two levels. At the generative level, I'd be surprised if really anybody on this planet is very different. I think the comparison with uh, close, uh, close apes would be really interesting to see, you know, wh whether there are different, how big in a way, and whether there are differences. Um, then comes the level of actual selection and there you start talking so if you then look at again unique receptors everybody we've looked at with of course this database bias that we all know who's in the databases people who work in labs uh i mean with if you look at unique receptors you're in we're all incredibly the same if you look at Clone, clonotype frequencies, that's where we start dif differing, and that's why this imprint works. So my guess is if you take somebody from Papua New Guinea or any of the other places you mentioned, or somebody that lives in a sort of more uh, pathogenetically uh, rich environment, you're going to see differences in these clone type distributions. So they may be even more different than my they, they may share even less with us than uh, the us, you know, that I already showed share very little. But at the level of machinery, I mean, I could be wrong, but I would be very, very surprised if the generative process is different. Does that answer your question? Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I don't think we got any other questions, uh, and it is quite late. So I would really, really want to like to thank you uh, for this amazing talk and for answering all our questions. And I would also like to invite everyone. Well, I'm trying to share the screen. Um, I'm not sharing. Am I sharing? I think I'm sharing. Um, so I'd like to also invite everyone for our next webinar in two weeks. This time it's going to be, we are moving away from science, going to history, and I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, so make sure to follow us on Facebook or website or wherever you get all the information from. And thank you so much again. Thank you all for coming. Uh,
and thanks everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.